We're back. It's us here at you. <laughs> UK Motor Talk. Because we couldn't shut up, it's time for another podcast. This is, and we're constantly doing it, we are UK Motor Talking. I'm Mike. I'm Jim. Good evening. I'm Graham. Hello and welcome. And we have all had a a beverage because we're not driving, because of course we're doing this from home. And now it's time to talk cars. And I want to start with Fiat because, well, it's not that they're back. It's that they've suddenly started making things again. Now they're part of Stellantis. They've decided to have a bit of a refresh of the range. Did, did they ever go away? Or Fiat just have a habit of stopping making things but not telling anyone? Yes, they fizzle out, don't they? And then just leading to massive disappointment. Well, I suppose disappointment is probably a strong word, but a, uh, a feeling of, oh, oh, okay, fair enough. I, I didn't realise that had finished. It's like a... It's like the end of a podcast It's like a soap sometimes. opera that you don't watch being cancelled and then you don't realise it has been cancelled for about two years. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's that awkward, <laughs> that awkward moment, isn't it, when you think, "Oh, they just died." I thought they died years ago. That that is basically what See, happened. I with had the that the other day with uh, there was uh, I've got a, a WhatsApp group with a few mates, and they're all far more into football than I am. And they said, uh, "Is anyone watching the uh, the Paul Gascoigne versus the rest of the world match?" And I was like, "Didn't he die?" I was like, "I'm sure Paul Gascoigne died a year or so ago." They're like. No way. He's he's playing like he did. To be fair, um, he's playing. They, they had to let. Yeah, yeah. He was playing. They, they had to let him have about three shots on goal. But it was it was a little bit like when they invite a child onto the pitch to you know do the kick off and the keeper deliberately dives the wrong way and uh, did Vinnie you know, Jones American slide tackle football, him? They uh, American football. They you know they let the kid get the ball and everybody jumps out of the way and he scores a touchdown. It was a bit like that, but I, was, I could have sworn he was in the news for something and he was dead, but yeah, maybe it was something else. I'm not sure. There we We've are. Got off topic. Well, we well done, about? Paul Gaskell. Fiat. We were talking about Fiat. Um, which oh, is yes, the, Fiat. Well, I, I, I saw the headline, which was Fiat plans to become an EV only automaker by 2030. And it's like, no, what? 2027. On, isn't, that, isn't that the law? Yes, it is. Well, in this uh, well, country, anyway. Well, it isn't, it isn't, isn't now. Is it 2030? Fiat, good news, we're carrying on. <laughs> it just sounds a little bit like the uh, the email that you get off Hermes that says, good news, we've successfully managed to deliver your parcel. And it said where? such surprise. Yes, and shock where have and you all. delivered it? But the, they seem really chuffed with themselves and they feel the need to email you to tell you that they've done what it is they were supposed to do. Here's a photo of a porch. It's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> guess, look who's look who's guess whose porch this guess is. The porch. Yeah, you are, it is. you've received a parcel, but to actually find it, you will need to decipher a series of clues. Each will be more fiendish than the last. <laughs> What's the uh, the one they started doing every uh, every now and again was to put it in the wheelie bin. Yeah, <laughs> which was out on the day of collection. But actually, for uh, you and I, Gates, that's not really an issue at the moment because the bin men are on strike, aren't they? And they have they been are. for the last month, and I think they are going to be for another couple of weeks, I think, aren't they? They're going to really enjoy the uh, the nappies in my bin. They're not mine. Just just point that out there. That that's that's going to be choice. Uh, would be the word that, I, <laughs> that my granddad would use. Anyway, we we really do digress from from poo laden bins back to Fiat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not so far removed, really. They're, they're gonna, yes. <laughs> Speaking of which, the the five hundred L for me is the poo laden bin of Fiat. That is a car that has bastardised uh, a, a name badge of the five hundred L, obviously the original five hundred L, and made it into some sort of pseudo MPV, but not really, but sort of an SUV, but not really, but it's kind of got a bit of the face of the Fiat 500, but removes all the characteristics that make the 500, which is the Frank Stevenson. A bit like the Mini Clubman. Well, no, uh, the the Clubman (laughs) is fine compared to this. This is, this is just horrific. The 500 was, as we know, a, a Frank Stevenson design, a guy designed the new Mini, um, body that was dropped over a panda so the car itself it isn't that good to drive not gonna lie but it's cute and you kind of forgive it because it's pretty and it's quirky and it's kind of interesting the 500l it's all of the worst bits 
with more worst bits put on top of it, but raised slightly in the air. And then the inside of it looks like a 90s sofa. If you, you know those, those curtains and fabrics that everyone used to have that looked like someone had thrown up on a curtain? That, that is the inside of it. It is the most horrific car I've driven for a long time since maybe the Chevrolet, Chevrolet? Since maybe the Chevrolet Avio or the, the Chrysler Sebring, all those horrific cars that were basically a wart on the road of Great Britain. Um, mm. It is a horrific, horrific car. Is, that, is, is somebody exhaling heavily or has somebody's soul just left their body? It's Graham. Yeah, is I'll, it? I'll, I'll certainly do that if you wish. I think that the microphone I've just stopped just talking. Up the fact that Graham was sat there with a deadpan look on his face, I actually thought Graham had just died on the podcast there. Please don't do that. There's a twist well, at the end of this be, podcast. It would be my Tommy Cooper moment, wouldn't it? And in this <laughs> podcast, Mike rants about the Fiat 500 whilst Graham dies. <laughs> So anyway, Fiat, Fiat are back. They want to be an electric-only um, provider by 2027. So all the manufacturers have, to, have be to be at least hybrid by 2030 and then fully electric by 2035, depending on where you decide to read this information or what the government decides it wants to do this week, because it changes constantly. I think Volvo have already said 27 as well for them. Well, they reckon, they reckon they're going to do it sooner. And it's, it, what's interesting about that is the Fiat 500 electric which has been produced alongside the previous 500. A is, I think, quite a good-looking thing, if, if you're into that kind of thing. And I, I quite like, traditionally, people would say slightly more effeminate cars, I guess, because I just seem to be drawn to them. In truth, the matter is, who cares? Drive whatever you like, whatever makes you happy. Because why buy a car to, to impress anyone else? I, why give a toot about them? Anyway, drive what makes you happy. So the, the, the 500, I think, is quite an interesting car. And I think it's quite an exciting car. And I think it's... Also, a reasonably cost-effective way to get into electric motoring if you live in a city. I, I think it's quite reasonable. So it makes sense that they would use some of that, that architecture to go underneath the Panda and then send that as merry way. So whereas the Panda gave itself to be the 500, now the 500 could give itself to be the Panda. But they don't want to do that. They're going to be putting the underpinnings of the E208 Corsa, whatever the other version of it is. Is there a Citroen version? Not sure. Probably. And they're going to make... The or a Citroen DS, gonna... which is honestly completely, totally separate and not a Citroen at all. But it actually but it's a Citroen. is. Yes. But it is. And I suspect at some point when they decide they need to bolster their registration figures, it will become Citroen, DS Citroen or something similar. I think it will. Much like the, the Escort and the Orion became the same car back in the 90s for Ford, so the Escort can stay on top. But yeah, the Citroen are apparently going to be making the bigger platform electric cars. And the... Yeah, it's a, Fiat are going to be making the small ones and getting the masses around. This just in. Graham has, has disappeared. What have we said? I hope he's yes, okay. I'm going to feel really shit if he's dead. Yes, this would be... Maybe, maybe that sound was his soul leaving his body and then he carried on talking for about five minutes and then disappeared. Is it a bit like when you, you when a chicken dies and it runs around for a bit? After, after Graham hmm. expires, he's going to sit there and talk about Fangio for five minutes. <laughs> just carry on. <laughs> just carry on. It's what he would have wanted Here's the thing, right? Fiat's historically, I know people love them. And, you know, the spiders and bits and pieces, the classic stuff, interesting, coupe, interesting, all that kind of stuff. And it's got character. A barchetta. Yes, beautiful, lovely car. But EVs don't really have that kind of character. The point is, I guess, that I'm making at this point is that if you are going to underpin everything with the same stuff that's under a Vox or a Peugeot, which, let's face it, aren't particularly exciting to drive then you want it to at least look nice. And I think Fiat have kind of got that bit right. So although I was wax lyricaling about the, the 500, I, the 500L push that to the side. The 500 itself is an interesting car, and I think it does look good. And I think the previous shape Panda, and even the original Panda, I think is an interesting car, utilitarian, but an interesting car to look at for what it is. So I guess if you're going to have a car that drives like everything else, then you might as well have something that has a bit of bit of style to it. And why not have Italian style? Because it's going to be the same car underneath. You might as well make your radio-controlled car body something relatively interesting. That is a good point, actually. I only had one... Uh, well, actually, no. I had a couple of different radio-controlled cars for different things. I had a, a monster truck, a, uh, a touring car, saloon car type thing, and, uh, and an off-road buggy. Uh, but several different body styles for all of them. So actually, yeah, yeah. actually, yeah, radio-controlled cars have preempted the motor industry by about forty years by having yep. 
one a chassis, and chassis. You just plonk whatever body you want on top of it. Yeah. They're basically, like the, the old T... Do you remember the Tamiya TB chassis? The tub chassis? Yeah, I had a, a TA... Well, okay, actually, I think Tamiya, Tamiya are missing a trick here because everything uh, radio-controlled electric that they do is, uh, is what, one-tenth scale. Yeah, so scale how hard up. is it? Yeah, how hard is it just to move the decimal point along on everything and just do mm. that? It, yes, it seems like a great idea. I think that sounds like a superb idea. Make it that bit bigger. Then again, the body shells were very flimsy and you'd get very cold and wet without putting the other bits inside it. But I get, I get what you're saying. They, they do seem to be very qualified to make electric cars. Why haven't they done it? Ah, see, I, I overcame that. I bought a Terry's chocolate orange and cut up the plastic inner that held the orange into wheel arch liners. Great idea. those inside the, uh, the body shell. So there we are. Top tip. How big would your chocolate orange have to be? You'd have to buy space hoppers. Didn't get what? Thank you, Siri. Right. You're welcome. I, I, guess, I guess that's it, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, Siri. It Breaking news. Graham is not dead. It's just his battery that's expired, and that's not even a metaphor. Although he's still managing to text us. How is he doing that? Ah, no, this is suspicious now, because it's it's that somebody's murdered somebody, and then somebody else, they're using their phone to text other people and say everything's okay. It's it's that kind Mm. of thing, isn't it? I remember reading a couple of of mysteries when I was a kid. There's been all this kind of stuff like people just in the heating, so it doesn't look like people have been dead so long or whatever. One that I particularly liked, a woman that killed her husband that was a copper, he used a, a frozen leg of lamb and then cooked it, and then let his colleagues eat the lamb. So they wouldn't so be able to identify the they, they ate, ate the, the murder weapon. Brilliant. And someone that used ice, just generally ice, to kill someone. The variations on the theme, there's lots of ice-related murders. Anyway, mm. we're not saying that we've murdered Graham, he is fine, he's texting us. Now this sounds suspicious, because we're saying that he's texting us, saying he's alright, when we suspect he's not. Because how is he texting us with a flat battery? Anyway... I suspect it's time to move on from batteries, and I think we should talk about dinosaur juice. Uh, well, I think we should, and, and there's probably a bit of a ranting coming here, because we've, uh, here well, we I'm go. sure we've all seen over the last, uh, what, month, six weeks or so, that fuel prices in this country have gone absolutely ridiculous, haven't they? I mean, uh, yes. the, the most expensive you have to want it I've now. seen... It's one of those things, it's... it's or I, need it's it, become, one of the two. Well, I don't know, it's kind of one of those sort of slightly taboo things, isn't it? Like, you don't go out because, yeah, you need to drink something. You don't go, hmm, I'll have a fine malt today, do you? You have a, you have a, a scotch because you fancy having a scotch. Now you have to really want to have some fuel. Yeah, I suppose it's that, are, are you thinking twice about journeys? And actually, uh, yeah. uh, I think the most I've seen for uh, for diesel around here has been one, I think I saw 186 the other day, uh, but it's certainly <sighs> been 190 something in, in many places in the country. I mean, I haven't been anywhere near a motorway in the last six weeks. So uh, I dare say a lot of motorway services, it's over two pounds a litre of diesel and petrol I've seen at 176, 177 mm. for, for a litre. Chunky. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a good little push, pushing the, uh, the energy price cap that's seen the cost of a kilowatt hour rise by about 11 billion percent over the last couple of weeks. Putting that 54%. aside, it is... Mm. It is a, a bit of a push towards uh, EVs, but actually, even over the last uh, well, the last couple of days, and I suspect over the uh, the coming week or so, by the time you listen to this podcast, it's either going to be still going on, or thankfully, just a slightly distant memory is uh, is the actual availability of fuel because uh, everywhere is running out of fuel because uh, we've got a, a bunch of insert polite name for protesters here who so have spent the last couple of days gluing themselves to the tarmac outside fuel refineries to stop fuel tankers getting out or chaining themselves to fuel tankers to uh, to stop them going out and delivering i mean what i i'm sorry this this is an absolutely ridiculous situation that this is allowed to happen and they have uh, you know one one refinery had five different police forces turn up and and yet everything was still allowed to carry on. I mean, what what goes through these these cretins' minds that a they're allowed to do things like this, b that they think it's a good idea, c have they not got anything better to do, 
and D, what the hell gives them the right to disrupt other people's livelihoods, uh, other people's jobs, people who need fuel, bearing in mind uh, people who go to work as doctors, nurses, people who drive ambulances, people who uh, fight fires, etc. All Put the food essential on the shelves in shops, services, things that go on that Everything. deliver food to yeah. shops, that that open petrol stations so people can get petrol and go and do all these things. What the hell gives them the right to think that? Oh yeah, I can go out and disrupt this, and and this is going to change things. I mean, there's there's a way of getting your point across in in a way that people listen to you and and enact. Yeah meaningful change you come up with a reasoned balanced argument you sit down you do some research you come up with the pros and cons and you offer a solution it's no good sitting there saying that oh what we're doing is killing the planet that's no good that's that's nonsense that that argument doesn't carry any weight at all what you need to come up with is what we are doing is not good for the planet here are the ways that we can change it this is what we need to do and this is how I'm going to make it happen. We just want to point out here that we're, we're not against the idea of, of climate change, because that's, that's obviously happening, and you'd be needed idiot if you thought anything Well, I'm the against contrary. the idea of climate change. It's a very bad thing. Well, it's a bad thing, yes. Again, we know <laughs> this. But, it, but it's, it's happening, right? We, we understand this, and we understand that we need to take action to sort it. But on a Friday, demanding that the UK stops using fossil fuels by Monday is just ridiculous. It's absurd. It doesn't work. People aren't interested in helping your cause. They're just interested in you going away at this point. So, yes, you're making a point, but no one's going to listen to it because everyone just thinks that you're immature by doing things like gluing your face to a tanker. I did just think, hmm, I could say now that I I need to work from home, but, of course, that's a slight problem when you have a ready supply of, of fuel uh, yourself isn't it, it? Is. you can't you can't really argue that if you have a petrol station it doesn't doesn't quite work our hearts go out to everyone really we understand this is a pain pain in the bum frankly and it's a pain in the bum that doesn't need to happen because someone has decided they want to glue themselves to a petrol tanker and okay i get people want to do things and i understand that people have the right to protest and all the rest of it but just making a public nuisance of yourself you're not going to get the support of people you have the right to say and do pretty much whatever it is you like in in this country you can do what you want to do go where you want to go it's 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 a wonderful country to uh to we live do have in, a lot of civil liberty don't we yeah, exactly but it's it's the they seem to forget that basic fact of yes that's fine as long as it doesn't affect other people adversely it's difficult isn't it what what do you do I mean, changing the law to remove these people like the people that sat on the m25 i i, I, I care so little about their cause because of the disruption they've caused i made a point of mm. not looking it up so i can't even remember who they were called and i get they're trying to make a point and all that happened was the entire country went idiots and dragged them out of the way mm. regardless of whether they're right wrong or whatever they, they, they probably have got a, a fairly sensible point at the, at the bottom the bottom line of what it is they're trying to say in that stop killing the planet and yes that's probably a very good idea because i live on this planet so i kind of need it i have a vested interest in the planet staying here whilst yeah yeah i I would quite like it to stay here roughly where it is at roughly the temperature it is as you say we've got a vested interest in this planet sort of hanging around in a roughly spherical shape and not being 378 degrees and for those of you who are listening now thinking, at the point it faded out, how much did I miss? <laughs> the answer is that Andrew's edited out at least 37 minutes of ranting. I mean, and it, 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 went, it went mad. It went all the way from jelly tots to the polar ice caps. to There's so many things we talked about. And, and to be honest, we're doing you a favour by not letting you hear them. Anyway, moving on to more things motoring. We spoke earlier on about Italian stuff and something else that's made perhaps with passion and not necessarily always well, but French stuff. Now, I'm not really interested in in Peugeot. Citroëns, we've all decided are interesting, if not the best thing in the world, sometimes the most squishy, but certainly interesting. Renault's, I think, a bit of a divisive one because generally speaking, and I, I worked for a Renault dealer for a while, I don't really like any of the standard Renaults at all, with may- exception of maybe the Espace, because it was it was interesting and it was squishy what it was, and it fell apart after four years like most of the others. But what I, I've always championed is that the fast Renaults, they seem to have got right. So 182 is 
it's pretty good value still. They've gone up in money a bit. They were about two grand. And now for a half decent one, you're probably talking for a bit more. Um, and then there were things like the R26R, the one that had all the scaffolding in the back. Well, there's been all kinds of things. And if you, that's assuming you don't include things like Alpine, of course, which are part of Renault. And as you know, I'm a massive fan of the current Alpine. And the original Alpine as well, I thought was very pretty. And I do have a, a, a soft spot for them. Uh, well, I like a, a Clio Cup. One seven two one eight two thingy. I like I like that sort of ilk, as you say, the fast ones. Uh, in fact, the first time I ever drove around the uh, well, the only time I ever drove around the Nurburgring ring was in a uh, in a Clio one seven two. So I've got good memories of that day. But I don't know, Renault for me, there was just, I, yeah, I'm I'm not really sure. But flicking through the um, collection that they've they've sold off. I wasn't sure if this was a precursor to them leaving the UK entirely. Although, have they left the UK entirely? When no. When you can buy what, a Renault these days. What, what Renault have Renault done dealer. is they've basically said when we're going to, at the end of the Renault Sports, in, with an engine, basically, they're going to be electric from now on in. And they, they've basically cleared house. And this came as a surprise because flicking through collecting cars, the entire Renault collection is for sale. And these are, you know, these are the quite special cars, like the first of the 182 trophies. They've got chassis number one came up for sale as a V6 and a few other bits and pieces. One that caught my eye was the, uh, the 2000 Renault Clio Mark II 1.2 Grande, phase one. Nice. I mean, that's, that's and the, pretty. The only reason that caught my eye is because uh, my, uh, my dad had one of those for a bit because it came up on a silly cheap lease deal. Uh, it was blue, his one, but it was a 1.2 grande. Do you know, I had one in that colour, and it, I forgot it was a, a, a grande, grande, whatever you want to call it. It was a, a 1.2. It was relatively spicy for a 1.2. <laughs> and I remember it had been buried up and the gearbox blew up. That would be, that, that's my lasting memory of that. Went to put a new gearbox in it, and they somehow changed the design. We had to get two or three different gearboxes and mash them together to make the thing run again it was horrific see i, d- I just remember it because it was the most uncomfortable thing to drive the accelerator brake and clutch all felt identical in yes terms of weight, <laughs> so it made it very tricky to drive but it also had a wonderful habit the uh the uh sensor on the rear suspension that detected how much weight you had in the boot would frequently jam in the you're carrying loads and loads and loads and loads of paving slabs in the boot. So when you press the brake pedal, I'd better send what felt like about 80% of the brake pressure to the <laughs> rear wheels to the, to the point where basically the foot brake just became a handbrake, which was hilarious fun because it meant that you could do handbrake turns very, you know, using servo assistance powered brakes. But when, <laughs> when you had to stop a little bit sharpish and you jammed on the brakes and the rear end just locked itself solid it, it did lead to the odd brown trouser moment i just remembered that my grande cleo grand cleo whatever it was was called nobby the, reg- the registration said nobby on it i think that was a, a 2000 car i had some had a set of of blingy oz racing alloys on it i'm, I'm, I'm trying to find a picture of it it, it was a thing most certainly uh, and then I had another, I've, I've had three Renaults. This occurs to me, all of them have been cooking spec ones. I, I'm completely ruining my own point here. They were not the cars you'd want to own. Uh, I will agree with myself in that respect. However, I somehow managed to own them. I had that, that uh, Grande Clear. I had another one which was blue and the uh, and it overheated and the head gasket went and that was rubbish as well. And then I had one of the worst cars I've ever owned, which was a McGann in a sort of beigey gold colour with a panoramic roof that was questionable as to whether if you opened it, it would never shut again. Torn leather and something. It's a 2006 car. It wasn't a high mileage. And it was a company-owned car and then the guy owned it. And it came in as a trade-in. The sole purpose I bought it would be that I would have owned it long enough to go on the scrappage scheme. <laughs> and my next-door neighbour was in You bought it di- with, the, with the express intention of crashing, crashing it. it slightly further yes. down the line. So just, just sentencing it to death, basically. Exactly that. I, I got it because I thought what I would do is we would wait until we got another scrappage car in and we could just drive them into each other for fun. And then we could scrap That would have been fun. It would have been fun. My next door neighbour had the dire need We could have taken them on a track day and we could have just punted each other off into the scenery. <laughs> 
Just, just because this sounds entirely irresponsible. But anyway, my next door neighbour was in dire need for a car. Don't do that on the track day. Don't ever do that on the track day. Um, so I, I said to him, look, if you want to tax and insure it, you go ahead and you can just you <laughs> drive it. You, you drive luck. this thing. Um, and he drove it. And I said, he said, what are you going to do with it? I said, look, I'm, I'm going to crash it into a wall and I'm going to scrap it. And he goes, do you want to sell it? I went, not really. <laughs> and he bought it. He bought the thing off of me and then continued to use it for two years. So I had to look at it every single day for two years. And admittedly, it was a relatively interesting looking began because it had one of those shaking that ass back ends on it. Although it was the five door, which was never as good looking as the three door, which still looks relatively interesting by today's standards. It was a two litre, which meant that it wasn't particularly quick, but was very, very thirsty. And then I couldn't believe it. Well, because I, I drove it once or twice to the tip with stuff in the back and it was miserable. Uh, but I couldn't believe it when some years later, the bloody thing pulled around a corner near where I live. Like, no, how is this thing still alive? And the, <laughs> how is it running? They were one of the least reliable cars I'm sure they ever made. All the electrics used to fail. The little switch where you put the card in used to go wrong. All the electric windows went wrong to the extent where they covered them years was, out of warranty. Was that the one where they put the hole for the key ring in the same end that you had to shove in to the car? Yes. So you yes, couldn't exactly put it that. on the key ring. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that, you're right. It had that key card with, with the same thing. It had some, some interesting features. But it was just, oh, it was horrible. And I ended up having to drive it places and then look at it every single day. <laughs> but the quick ones are relatively interesting to drive. Not slowly. The, the 197 Clio not very good to drive slowly. And the cup ones, which have very stiff suspension, will rattle all your fillings out. But when everything connects and you get the right bit of road and everything hooks up, they are really quite sublime. The, the, say the 182, 197, not so much for my money. I actually thought the 172 and 182 drove better than the, the V6. Um, Clio, this is obviously. Um, and the Megans, the Renault Sport Megans, were very good value, all things considered except for um, the Megan, and I forget which way around it went. I think it was the, I, get, I do get this wrong, the Renault Sport Megan RS, it shouldn't be called an RS, it's Renault Sport, 275 Trophy R, maybe, that came with carbon ceramic brakes that you could spec. One of my customers bought one for the sole purpose of taking it on track day. So he ran it in by driving to Spa and then immediately spent the rest of the day driving around Spa. That was the running period. And he only ever drove it to a racetrack, around a racetrack. And I remember him coming in saying, right, we need to look at the brakes. I was like, yeah, it's fine. Look, we'll have a see how much the disc side. £2,000. What? Because the carbon ceramic brakes. So we ended up putting old fashioned style steely brakes on it, whatever. And it got ridiculously expensive by the end. But I, I kind of get, and I, I celebrate these cheap, small, fast cars because they are so much fun. And things like the Fiesta ST, like the i20N, all that kind of stuff, they're about as much fun as you can legally have on the road now. You can have hyper hatches with 400 brake horsepower, whatever you like. But as we found out when I had the RS, you can't use all of it and get the performance that the car can produce at the sort of speeds that don't lose your license. Whereas you, with a hot hatch with 200 odd brake horsepower, you can go out there and enjoy it. And that, I guess, brings us back to the selling off of the Renault collection. They had some interestingly disinteresting cars there, like, as you say, the Phase 1 Mark II um, Clio. And there's a few Renault 5s and bits and pieces in there. But there was some pretty juicy stuff in there, some pretty expensive stuff in there as well, wasn't there? Uh, yeah, I mean, flicking through the uh, flicking through list, yeah, the Phase 1... Mark II was uh, quite a reasonable £2,600, I thought, which which seemed about right. It was a tidy example and probably something 11,000 miles, seems all right. Tuck away if, uh, if you feel so inclined. Um, but as uh, as always, yeah, it was the uh, the older stuff uh, attracted more money. I mean, the, uh, the Mark I that had done 28 and a bit thousand miles, which actually was an automatic. I didn't realise until I'd uh, clicked and on the And a five-door. Or four door hatch, uh, yeah, but opinion. very, very rare. Uh, but that that kind of brings back memories because a, a mate at school had one of those as his first car, albeit manual, but it was that color. 
and uh, mm. and it's just yeah, there's a, a certain amount of nostalgia going on there. But that was four thousand two hundred pounds, which naturally I I think is probably about right because it's a a tidy one of them. Uh, but it was the um, the V six phase two that that got me at eighty seven thousand six hundred and fifty four English pounds. This is eighty seven and a half grand. For a clear, I mean, it's I, okay. I get it. It's a V six, and it's one of them. Mm. But it's eighty seven and a bit thousand pounds. It's that's a lot of money. Isn't it? It's getting to the realms of being a bit silly now. I mean, eighty seven grand buys you some very serious machinery, and I know that this might have been a car that a lot of people lusted after years ago, and probably still do now. But it's much like the Cosworths, isn't it? Yeah, you, you see the Sierra Cosworths, they, they, they're over 100 grand, some of them. It, well, it just I, I like that Clio V6 just because I remember Jensen Button getting told off for doing donuts and ruining Lord March's lawn <laughs> when uh, when he drove one of those up the hill at Goodwood. So that's that's kind of got good memories for me. But beyond that, it's I, maybe I just don't really get it, but 87 and a bit thousand pounds. It's, yeah, I, was, I mean, it's it's obviously bought by somebody who has plenty of other cars in their collection is it's hardly unlikely they've saved up 87 and a bit thousand pounds and that happened to come up and they've spent all their money on that one car but it's a clear it's yeah 87 thousand pounds well that that alpine which was 81 thousand pounds which came from in their own words the collection of a uh, a rally driver a, a spanish rally champion in fact of their exact words um Ooh, so I'll, I'll let you... i wonder Mm, I'll let you draw your own conclusions as to where that's come from. Uh, I like the idea that that would have had some some pedigree behind it, and it is achingly pretty. They are tiny, actually. They are really tiny, but so pretty. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm feeling that, and it's in that lovely blue as well. And when I say I'm feeling it, I'm not I'm not feeling it, but I'm you know I'm feeling it. Yeah, it's some, some very expensive French stuff in there. But I guess if you're into it, you're into it, aren't you? I didn't realise, actually, that some of the um, early Rally Sport McGann's, the 225s, are sort of dropping into the two grand territory. Worth a look if you're into your track day cars, maybe. Worth a look. But just bear in mind, if it has got a cup, chassis, bushes, all that kind of stuff on there, then the bushes will all be knackered because they were knackered when they were new. Not long after they were new, we were constantly replacing cup bushes. I seem to remember on Clio's and Twingo's and the like. Incidentally, Twingo's quite good fun. And I don't see any of those in their collection. Mr. Trick there. Maybe a reason. So, the future is electric, for Renault at least. And let's hope they make that Renault Fiver in an electric, guys. I'd like to look at that. You remember the concept from a, from a, a couple of years back? That was a, a good-looking thing. I really hope that happens. And to be fair, the new head of Renault, I say new head of Renault, the current head of Renault, because he's not that new any longer, he's interested in, in doing these kind of things and making stuff that's interesting. And if there's two options to make either a, you know, a humdrum version or a sporty version, he goes for the sporty one. He makes that call. And good on him, I say. Well, that's quite good, and uh, and like we said previously, there's a, the reason lots of these cars fetch such silly money is uh, is because it's nostalgic for people our age who've uh, now, in theory, got a couple of quid. Not us, I hasten to add. No, not us. Got eighty-seven and a bit thousand pounds to spend on a clear. I'm not that rich or that nostalgic. Um, but the you know cars like that, they're they're memories from our youth. So the uh, it, it recaptures that feeling of being seventeen, eighteen year olds again. So actually, is is that a very wise direction to go in for a big car company to say you know all the cars that you wanted when you were sixteen, seventeen, eighteen that you couldn't afford, we're making them now for you, and now you're in your your forties, late thirties, early fifties, whatever it happens to be, and and you've got a couple of quid. You can now have it. I mean, let's let's face it. If VW said, uh, "Yeah, we're going to come out with a new EV. It's going to have a hundred and sixty mile range and uh, and be twenty four grand, but it looks exactly like a Mark II Golf," I'd buy that in a yes. heartbeat. Yeah, and, and to an extent, I guess car manufacturers they do that. I mean, C Mini, for example, Mini was 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 designed to appeal to to a funky driver. Um, but by the same token, it was designed to appeal to people who'd driven the original Mini. People that, that whose spines maybe would have been shattered by driving the original Mini down the line. So you, for example. For, like me, yes. I'm just shattered yeah. full stop. But yeah, I, there's, there's definitely a place for nostalgia. And certainly, it's the reason why I think so many of these 80s and 90s hatches are now, are now peaking. In the same way that we saw the stuff that was vintage cars were, were attracted to a certain kind of age of people that are disappearing off. 
classic cars, new C cars will peak and drop, and I guess that's where we are. And on that note, I guess it's time for us to peak and drop. Hooray! And on that note, Graham has still gone, but I'm Mike, and I'm saying goodbye. And from me, Jim, it's goodbye. Take care. And from us, it's goodbye. Goodbye. UK Motor Talk, a first take media production.